Tena tato e te fare. Neira katuku atu inami hiki na monga fakahi um, e tafaro nei i a tato. Ka mihi ki na waitapu e tere tere atura. E na tana ta fenua o tene wahi nati fatua ki ora kei. Tene o kamihi nui ki a toto e pupuri tonu ana i te mana motu hake o tene wahi tena koto. No reira, e nga mana, e nga reo, e nga matawaka, e nga hau e fa, e ro rangatirama. Tena koto kua taimai nei ki te tōtoko i tēnei kōpapa o te wā. Nei rā te mihi, nei rā te mihi, nei rā te mihi. Me mihi ka tika ki tō tātō kōpapa e whakakotahi nei i a tātō i tēnei rā. Huri noa i tō tātō whare, tēnā koto, tēnā koto. Tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, warm welcome, a very brief translation. We have some on Zoom in the Netherlands who might not have caught much of what I just said, but I acknowledge the majestic mountains that shield us, the rivers that are flowing, the iwi, the, the uh, natifatua of this land and their role in preserving this land, and then all the peoples and tongues and cultures and esteemed guests that have come to be part of our connected activity this evening. Greetings to all, thank you for coming. And then at the end, I simply uh, said uh, that we hope that we all are here united in this purpose to enjoy one of our colleagues giving her professorial lecture. Professor Marcia Adipus. I didn't mention her name in the mihi, but that's not standard. So with all, without that, that's essentially what I would say. Kia ora everyone, welcome. We'll sing the faculty waiata, which you see there on the screen. And um, please join in if you know it. If you don't, uh, hum along. Okay. Ko te manu e te Anena itirea, o te kura tangata, ko te kura tangata, te lehe whakamanana, i te tapu o te tangata, ma tato katoa, ko te kura tangata, te lehe whakamanana, i te tika, Te pono, kia ho ho, te ro. Hi ome hi. By the way, I am Robert Gregory, Dean of Arts. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Malcolm Campbell tōku ingoa. I'm Malcolm Campbell. I'm the Head of School of Humanities, and it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to March's inaugural lecture. I'd like to particularly welcome her family and friends, students, former students, colleagues, and um, those from the university to community to what's a really important occasion for us. Um, March is a graduate of the University of Canterbury and took up her position at Auckland in 2003 when her predecessor, Christian Leitz, left the university and took up a position in Switzerland at UBS, working as their in-house historian. It was a time of change for history at Auckland as we moved from the 20th to the 21st century. At the end of the 20th century, history was very different, particularly modern European history, when at a time history had appointments in modern German history, French history, Russian history, 18th century British history, as well as people who dabbled in Victorian history too. 
But times were to change and modern European history was in very good hands with March's appointment. She brought to Auckland an energy for teaching that was and is reflected in the high levels of student engagement in her courses, and which has seen a steady stream of postgraduates work on European topics. And it's a delight to see so many of those former students here today. March has also built an excellent record as a researcher that's evident in her internationally recognized scholarship on the history of European neutrality and war. It's evident in a wide range of publications. Her first book, The Art of Staying Neutral, The Netherlands in the First World War, was published in 2006 by Amsterdam University Press. That was followed by An Age of Neutrals, Great Power Poly Politics, published by Cambridge University Press. More recent books include The Hague Conferences and International Politics, published by Bloomsbury, and The First Age of Industrial Globalization, published again by Bloomsbury, the latter co-written with Gordon Morell and published in 2019, and much enjoyed by students in March's Bloodlands course. In addition to monographs, she's published a series of very well-received edited collections, including several co-edited with our colleague, Sarah Butsworth. And it's great to see Sarah here tonight as well. March's next book, co-authored with Ismay Thomas, is Global War, Global Catastrophe, Neutrals, Belligerence and the Transformation of the First World War, to be released by Bloomsbury later this year. We're really looking forward to the release of the book and to tonight's lecture. Please join me in congratulating Professor Avendwies and inviting her to deliver her inaugural lecture. In a mana, in a reo, in a iwi, a ro rangatirama, cotene takumihi, kina natu, nata fatua, orake, a kitefare, o waipapa tomata ro, namihi nui, ka koto katoa. Good enough, dear colleagues, friends, family, students both gathered here and Zooming in from all over the world. Good evening. I acknowledge you all, and I thank you greatly for being here tonight. I'm honored to be able to give this inaugural professorial lecture, and I particularly wish to thank Dean Robert Greenberg and Head of School Malcolm Campbell for their kind introductions and unfailing support of my endeavors over the years. I want to thank my wonderful colleagues, most of you who are here today, my amazing students, and my friends here at the University of Auckland, Waipapa Tomato Rau, and all the amazing mentors I have had over the years from whom I have learned so much. I stand tall on the shoulders of giants. I wish to acknowledge my family, my wonderfully proud parents who are right up the front here, my magnificent sister who is uh, Zooming in and her family who are Zooming in all the way from Groningen, my delightful children, Joseph and Helena, and my extended family, both living in Aotearoa and in the Netherlands, and particularly those who have housed me, fed me, entertained me, and loved me on oh so many extended research trips back there. And lastly, but most of all, I want to thank my rock, my hold fast, the love of my life, my husband, Gordon Morrell. I would not be giving this lecture today were it not for you. In her superlative novel, The Eighth Life for Brilka, one of Nino Haratishvili's characters makes an enticing remark. You can't put the simultaneity of the world into words. It's enticing because for quite some time now, I have fixated on explaining and understanding the past as a product of human experience, of human agency, interconnection, and power dynamics. I am, as my dear friend and former colleague, Judith Bassett, who's also in the audience tonight, 
once quipped of me, a helicopter historian who hovers in on a moment of time, a moment of human experience, and then zooms out to cast my gaze as far and wide as possible to try to explain that moment in the context of all the rest that is going on at about the same time, before flitting off somewhere else and honing in to see how that moment, moment too might be connected. My graduate students uh, will have experienced this in our classes uh, this year. They're off all over the world, all at the same time. My aim in all this hovering is to try to find some kernel of truth, of understanding, of explanation that crosses space and place and simultaneity, and thus ultimately to try, as impossible as that task may be, to make sense of the human condition caught in a moment, which of course in all reality was and remains a complex web of human chaos. It's the paradox of the historian. How do we make something explainable that is in general chaotic? But if I am known of a, as a historian of anything, it is as a historian of neutrality. I study the art of not going to war when others do. Yet I did not begin as such. When I started my PhD at the University of Canterbury, under the empathetic guidance of Drs. Vincent Orange and Campbell Craig, I considered myself a military historian who was able to take advantage of my status as a migrant to connect the historical fascination elicited by the First World War in my adopted country, Aotearoa, New Zealand, to the study of my country of birth, the Netherlands, whose historians really questioned the history of their non-belligerency in the First World War. This despite the fact that the country bordered belligerent Germany, occupied Belgium, and sat across the North Sea waters, mere kilometers from belligerent Great Britain. So this PhD resulted in that uh, book cover there, and that ended up being a study of how a country's military institutions became guardians of a country's neutrality by upholding the security, trade, defense, and legal requirements uh, that, affect, that would apply to all neutral states in time of war. The study tried to show not only how precarious remaining neutral when all one's neighbors uh, went to war was, but also how important the Netherlands government and the actions of its inhabitants were to the course and conduct of the war conducted between the European great powers and to the lived experiences of war for locals living in or near the country's beleaguered frontiers. So this work on the Netherlands and its borders in the First World War began a career's worth of interest in studying communities whom we might describe as being at peace while others and often their neighbors were at war. And in studying the international power dynamics in play when some go to war while others abstain from doing so. So much, although by no means all, uh, with much thanks to my wonderful friend, Sarah Butsworth, my historical work to date uh, has fixated on explaining as the American president Thomas Jefferson so evocatively described the purpose of the United States neutrality in the war between Britain and France in 1793, as an ambition, he called it, to come and go freely, as if the war among others shall be for neutrals, as if it did not exist. Now, after years of studying neutrality, there is one thing I can say, Jefferson is wrong, was wrong, is that is an impossible um, ambition. There is very little about neutrality in wartime that was, or I would say today even, is abstemious, impartial, or value neutral. In the modern era of global interconnectedness, a war among others is nearly always affected by the actions of a neutral neighbor. For not going to war, I would argue, is as important to the conduct and course of a conflict as taking up arms. Neutrality, like all foreign policy positions, is essentially self-interested. It aims at the protection of vital concerns, be they defensive, economic, imperial, 
of humanitarian. Neutrality is an act of power. And during the long 19th century, neutrals and neutrality fulfilled an enormous range of functions uh, as noted on this slide. So in time of war, there were always more neutrals, interstate war particularly, there were always more neutrals than belligerents in play in the 19th century world. And those neutrals fulfilled all sorts of functions, one of which was as economic agents. Some would call them profiteers. They supplied arms, foodstuffs, fuels, raw materials to the belligerents. They sustained and made profit from war. They were the bankers and financiers of war. They also, at the same time, proffered humanitarian support, medical aid to uh, warring, uh, uh, warring armies, or refugee support. Neutral governments offered good offices, which meant they stood uh, and they helped civilians caught in enemy countries or enemy empires and helped them get home or helped them with their endeavors so that they would not become victims, civilian victims of the war. Neutral countries, neutral territories were often places of refuge for refugees or political or artistic or ideological exiles from a place uh, in uh, crisis, revolution or war. As such, they could also become hubs of revolution, potential belligerents that could become involved uh, in the war at a moment's notice. Neutral spaces and neutral uh, territories often acted as geostrategic breakers keeping potential belligerents apart, affecting the strategic uh, direction of a military campaign. They were places where spies lived, where information exchange occurred. Neutral states, neutral institutions, even neutral individuals from neutral countries often acted as mediators and negotiators uh, in time of war to try to alleviate crisis or to bring a war to an early end. Neutral populations, neutral media were always witnesses and judges of a war's violence and often set the standards of assigning morality to who was right and who was in the wrong when it came to an interstate war. But most importantly, and this is what uh, my book on Age of Neutrals tried to argue, was that great powers, your Britons, your Frances, your Russias, your United States, your Japans of the 19th century, also use neutrality to sustain their power in the international system. They helped use neutrality to avoid going to war and in, as such helped to promote certain norms and values, um, many of which still dominate our world today. So while they were trying to restrain and restrict and limit the parameters of interstate war when it served their purposes, they also used those same uh, restraints to enable them to expand their empires and engage in imperial warfare and state violence in other places uh, in the world outside of Europe. So neutrality was never benign, it was always uh, an act of power, often great power. Even if the public relations aspects of neutrality often focused on the passé gérant, the peacemaking capacity of, um, of the non-belligerent uh, state. What I want to do today is not talk about the 19th century, but rather today I want to turn full circle and return to the historical place where I started my historical journey, namely to the First World War. And I want to do so by reflecting on the arguments made in uh, my most recent book that is coming out in October, uh, which I co-wrote with my friend and colleague the inspirational historian, Professor Ismay Thomas, who's research leader at the Netherlands Institute of War, Holocaust and Genocide Studies in Amsterdam and Professor of History at Utrecht University. Now, Ismay and I finished our PhDs on the subject of the Netherlands in the First World War um, at about the same time in the early 2000s. And then whenever we met, um, uh, subsequently, we always ended up discussing um, how inadequate, this is what historians do when they get together, how inadequate other historians are, how inadequate we considered the general histories of the First World War to be in integrating uh, neutrality uh, in their uh, master narratives. And certainly in, in so doing, uh, not integrating the global dynamics of the war very well at all. 
So at a particularly insightful conference on the subject of World War I neutrality, which we uh, uh, both attended in Seville in Spain, amidst the oranges, in 2014, we decided to do something about this gap. So at another insightful conference, this time in Madrid, in 2017, while we were cohabiting an Airbnb flat, we spent three days debating and I would say arguing uh, which, uh, among ourselves about what, um, what we hope would be to find a solution to explaining the essential simultaneity and globality of the violent contours of the First World War. So our book tries to argue that what made the First World War such a globally important and powerful event was the fact that it drew in and affected almost every community around the world, be it belligerent or neutral, part of an empire or an independent state. We argue not only that the war globalized quickly and violently, but also that it did so by transgressing the dynamics of international power while simultaneously reinforcing and expanding the norms of violence that had dominated the 19th century era of industrial globalization and imperialism. So this then is a book that marries the international history of the war, so the war conducted by governments and states, with the experiential history of the war, or rather the war as experienced by individuals and communities. In our history, the local and global realities of a world at war intersect in a complex and interdependent web. And today I want to expand on those complexities and interdependencies by looking at three themes. Firstly, the economic cost of the war on the social cohesion of communities. Secondly, the emotional cost of the military conduct of the war on families. And thirdly, the political cost of the war on government authority within and outside the imperial metropoles. And I want to do that by giving you a reasonably accurate map of the world uh, from 1914. And I'm going to um, talk about examples from all over the globe and uh, at the end of which I hope the kind of notion of a world in crisis uh, will come through uh, graphically as well as in what I, uh, my words. So I want to start here in German East Africa. And I want to uh, discuss how the Wagogo people of present day Tanzania describe the First World War with a one word moniker, Matunya, the scramble, they call it. In the words of the historian Tim Stapleton, after 1915, the Wagogo suffered the worst famine in the area's long history of drought this one created entirely by human activity. Because the German military authorities in the region confiscated food and cattle, conscripted 35,000 Wagogo men as carrier troops to support their military campaigns against the British in the region. When the British subsequently conquered the same region in 1917, they commandeered a further 27,000 local men into their carrier corps sequestered all available food, leaving as good as nothing for the locals to consume or replant. Collectively, these acts caused the Wagogo social order to effectively collapse. And we have reports of villages being abandoned as families looked for food, mob justice ruling, children being pawned, corpses littering the roads, and reports of cannibalism. Once the 1918 global influenza pandemic hit, very little was left of the Wagogo's pre-war uh, lifestyles, hence Matunya, the scramble. But the Wagogo were not unique. European historians, of course, have long debated the politics of hunger that suffused the economic war conducted between Britain and Germany between 1914 and 1918. You can find screeds, books and books, volumes and volumes of books explaining the willingness of both governments to control access to essential goods, be it foods or fuelstuffs, to conduct their European war, as opposed to the African war, which they did that too. 
we know much about the conduct of indiscriminate U-boat warfare and the imposition of extreme blockades. In many ways, the traditional histories of the war in Europe stress how essential the economic contours of this war were to the collapse of the central powers at the end of the conflict, namely Germany and Austria-Hungary, uh, and to the onset of the Russian revolutions in 1917, which of course led to the creation of the Soviet Union. By the time of the European hunger winter of 1916-17, Russian authorities warned, and I quote, that children are starving in the most literal sense of the word. Austrians were eating a third less grain than they had in 1913, and the average weight of a German adult had dropped from 60 kilograms in 1914 to 49 kilograms uh, by this time. What is surprising then is to find how essential experiences of scarcity, rationing, starvation were not just in Africa or in German East Africa and Europe, but across the globe. The politics of hunger suffused the politics of global warfare. So before the British um, attacked the Wagogo, they uh, ruled Nyasaland and Malawi, and they, in 1916, appropriated entire crops and cattle stocks as well, causing starvation, the spread of disease and social chaos. In 1916, in that same year, in neutral Spain, a skewed balance of trade, which favored food exports to the belligerents over imports, bolstered inflation to such an extent that it occasioned a genuine subsistence crisis, which had enormous political ramifications. And some historians um, lead those right to the Spanish Civil War of 1936. Meanwhile, in August 1916, in uh, uh, in neutral United States, bakers in Chicago doubled bread prices, and that resulted uh, due to the rising cost of wheat, which resulted in angry delegates of the National Housewives League protesting to Congress, demanding that the White House protect domestic consumption over the profits available of selling to the warring powers. At about the same time, Koreans suffered wholesale rice shortages when the belligerent Japanese, who ruled the Choson Peninsula, as requisitioned their rice stocks to feed their own population first. In the Middle East, across the Ottoman Empire, the Russian Caucasus and Persia, it is estimated that more than 10 million non-combatants died during the war, including one in seven Syrians, as a result of starvation, military activity, genocide, ecocide, and disease. As the Allied blockade prevented the export of local cash crops and the Ottoman government mismanaged the distribution of scarce resources, social norms and laws unraveled. Criminality expanded, cannibalism spread, as did the bubonic plague, typhoid and typhus. This is all before the Spanish influenza pandemic hit in 1918. Social crisis was inevitable. For Middle Eastern communities, the First World War registers as a war of civilians, a war, in the words of historian Najwa al Qatan, of near annihilation that created a world of beggars and beasts, animals, and cannibals, a war that caused a rupture in time. But consider, too, how a neutral Liberia the only African country to remain neutral by the end of 1914. The inability to obtain imports by 1915, especially from its main pre-war trading partner, Germany, resulted in an 80% decline in government revenue, a freeze on the payment of wages, the introduction of a controversial hub tax on every building in the country, widespread social upheaval, political strife, and police violence. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Atlantic in neutral Colombia, the exigencies of the wartime economic crisis, when um, uh, pre-war European investors removed their investments, reduced um, their exports and revoked imports on luxury items like bananas, resulted in a desperate financial situation which was so severe already in 1915 that the state stopped paying out wages to its bureaucrats and even disgorged the hapless victims of mental health asylums onto the streets 
for want of money to pay their nurses. Similar stories can be told of most other Latin and South American countries, which led the historian Philip Diener to designate the economic contours of the war across this entire continent as the war's far Western front. Much like the economic effects of the global war were felt in violent ways across the world, so too were the military contours of the war felt deeply by families in Fano. Consider, for example, how a Punjabi girl, Kishan Devi, wrote a letter to her father serving with the Indian Expeditionary Forces in Egypt in 1915, pleading for a safe return home. Historian Santanu Das records it, as he records it, Devi emotes deep anxiety and concern when she asks that her father, please take leave and come to meet us. Please do come. We repeat again and again. Devi's pleas for the safe return of a beloved parent were echoed in the letters, prayers, hopes and dreams of millions of families whose loved ones were caught up in the military theaters of this global war. Another Punjabi uh, soldier serving on the Western Front in France wrote home in 1915 with the words, for God's sake, don't come, don't come, don't come to this war in Europe. Tell my brother Muhammad Jacob, for God's sake, not to enlist. His words are almost identical uh, to those of a Vietnamese soldier serving with French troops on the same front who wrote home at about the same time, urging his friends to resist recruitment. My friend, it is better you do not come here. I would advise you to come here in peacetime, but in wartime, it is wartime, stay there. In the neutral Netherlands, the fear of war was also omnipresent. As one contemporary reflected on the 30th of July, 1914, as the country's conscripts were called up for military service, fearing an invasion from Germany. Such a deadly silence hung around the packed together crowd that one could hear the birds chirping in the gardens behind the houses. When it was announced that 15 military intakes of conscripts would be called upon, a breath of dismay, like a sudden wind surge, spread through the crowd. One woman fell unconscious. Other women started to cry silently and buzzing and stumbling, the crowd parted into the small streets where their dull footsteps echoed from the walls of the houses, which absorbed an unrest never known before. This description from the Netherlands bears an eerie resemblance to a diary entry of a Shiite cleric in Southern Lebanon, who described the general mobilization of the still neutral Ottoman Empire in early August 1914 as follows. The people were troubled and agitated. They gathered in small groups in public spaces, astonished and bewildered, as if confronting the day of judgment. Some wanted to flee, but where could they go? Others wanted to escape, but there was no way out. What connects these accounts? is fear of the known unknowns of war, the understanding of the dangers and costs of war. That mobilization leads most often to violence, invasion, death and destruction, suffering and uncertainty. And also the fear of the fact that wars heighten the powers of states and governments to determine the fate of individuals and communities. This war saw neutral and belligerent governments alike conscript troops labor force and essential workers. It witnessed the forced mobilizations of communities for war or in aid of the security of a neutral state, sometimes by force, including across Africa, in Egypt, where local authorities were known to kidnap men to serve in the Egyptian labor corps, in India, where whose jailed labor and porter corps was composed of inmates of India's prisons who were forced onto ships to undertake the worst sanitation and cleaning jobs for the British armies stationed across the Middle East. And once the United States went to war in 1917, after many years of neutrality, it too forced First Nations community to both till the soil, their soil, and produce food for the rest of the country and forced indigenous men to serve in the armed forces by means of police raids on their communities. So in that light, I want you to consider 
an account by Captain Kalyan Kumar Mukherjee, an officer in the 6th Division of the Indian Expeditionary Force, who survived the disastrous siege of Put al Amara in late 1915, a siege that resulted in the starvation of British occupation forces of the town and local residents alike. He was captured as a prisoner of war and he would ultimately die building the Anatolia to Bagtout Railway for the Ottoman Empire. But before his capture, he wrote a powerful letter to his grandmother back in the Punjab and in which he explained the following. Unless something surprising happens suddenly, I don't see why a war of this kind should not go on for another 20 years. So long as Germany can keep itself supplied with provisions and weaponry, I don't think this British side will be able to advance. Nor does it seem possible for Germany to advance any further into France. In this one year of war, a crore, which is something like a million people, English, German, Russian, French, Indian, African, together have been killed or wounded. Another crore of families are heartbroken because of selfish nationalism, a most inhuman sentiment. In other words, this war is proof that this brutal and selfish love of country, that this awful, malign sentiment is an obstacle for all humankind. Mukherjee's perspective is enormously revealing. It's 1915 perspective at that. For he understood the war already as a global tragedy, infused with powerful emotive ideas like nationalism and imperialism that affected so many individuals at their core. So it's really not surprising then that as the war ground on, that the ability of governments and authorities to keep the people, uh, soldiers and civilians alike, willingly at war faltered and in many places failed completely. The war stirred up enormous amounts of anti-imperial activism and exacted enormous amounts of violent repression in turn. And this was as true in belligerent communities like Singapore during the Singapore mutiny of 1915, Ireland, Easter Rising of 1916, as it was in the Kazakh territories of the Russian Empire, who uh, uh, protested both the uh, expansion of Russian uh, settler communities and conscription at the same time, as it was uh, across the Middle East, across Africa, and even in the neutral Dutch ruled Indonesian archipelago. The longer the war extended, the greater the need for the belligerent powers to exact as many human and material resources as possible from across their own empires as well as their neutral neighbors. But the longer it went on, the more that was asked, the greater the chance became that the communities affected by these demands would resist, rebel, and revolt, which they did. So the year 1917 then was a year of revolution that stretched well beyond Russia, even though the Russian revolutions, as I always tell my students, was the most important event of the First World War because it created ultimately the Soviet Union and helped to establish the contours of the 20th century. The historian Jay Winter calls 1917 the climacteric of the war, when the world of total global war evolved into a global crisis and inspired a spate of new and highly violent local consequences, including civil wars, revolts, revolutions, uprisings, and drastic government changes. Importantly, it was also the year that the last two remaining neutral great powers, the United States and China, joined the war as belligerents, forever changing the contours of the international system in the process and the ways in which the international arena would be shaped from this point on to our present. But importantly, when my favorite French person, uh, the awe-inspiring historian Annette Becker called the First World War a total global tragedy and the laboratory of all 20th century state violence. She did so by not acknowledging the enormous shifts in international power that this war evoked, but rather by focusing on the intense personal cost and violence experienced in communities around the world. So Esme's in my book 
takes Becker's concept of total global tragedy uh, and deconstructs it. It offers up key moments and themes to explain how the war transformed from an interstate conflict initiated by the European great powers in July and August 1914 to a global catastrophe, leaving no one unaffected. By late 1917, 1 1.4 billion people out of a global population of 1.8 billion were formally at war with each other, and very few communities and countries remained formally neutral. And I love this Chinese map uh, from late 1917 after China joined the war. The red bits are all going on, uh, on one side, on the Allied, on the Entente side. The blue bits are the central powers. The green bits are the bits in, in, in Latin South America that um, broke relations with the central powers but didn't declare war on them. The white bits, which is not entirely accurate because Persia was already at war too, and much of the Middle East that's white, there should be uh, some mix of colors. The white bits are the only bits that are left as neutral uh, by this time. One of the few major transformations elicited by the First World War is the shift away from neutrality, uh, which was so commonly mobilized before the First World War. Historians often describe the First World War as a total war. And they most often do so by arguing that total war is a condition of belligerency, of warfare. And it is dependent in that respect on three interconnected components. Firstly, the mobilization of all elements of state and society in aid of a country's war effort or an empire's war effort. Secondly, the conscription and coercion of all available human and material resources to support that war effort. And thirdly, the strategic targeting of an enemy's economic material and human resources. In other words, total war made everyone in the belligerent society responsible for the successful conduct of that war. In a society in total war, for example, uh, the female laborer working in a factory making artillery shells is as important to the cause and success of a country's war effort as the male soldier on a battlefield. And this German poster from 1916 brings out that graphically very well, I think. The corollary was, of course, that the laborer, male or female, working in an enemy factory, mine or farm, was deemed as, as legitimate a target of military violence as enemy as any enemy troops. But as Ismay and I want to stress, so was a neutral shipping company supplying an enemy with goods or a neutral bank underwriting an enemy war loan. In other words, the shift to total war that, occasion, that was occasioned during the First World War ensured not only that the belligerent governments willingly wielded blockade and hunger as weapons against enemy civilians, but also against neutral populations. The shift to total war thus presented neutral states, neutral commerce, neutral populations with a new set of expectations and realities. Their economic security, their sovereign independence, and their non-belligerency, even their lives, were all at risk of succumbing to the sh shifting sands of total war. At the same time, if it was on the backs of neutrals that economic warfare was pursued, then neutrals economic agency should be considered a weapon of total war. And as such, neutrals should be uh, incorporated in, uh, in the history of total war, and certainly as agents of the First World War. That's our essential argument. And it is in this light that the German jurist, Alex Liefschertz, argued in 1918 that in future wars, Neutrality could only exist if neutrals behaved as truly passive observers who kept to themselves and refrained from interfering in the business and supply of the belligerents. Liefschertz was not alone in advocating that by choosing to forego war, neutrals forsook any rights to have a say in international affairs. The United States President Woodrow Wilson came to the same conclusion when uh, his country went to war. This is after many years of making huge profits um, that underwrote, underwrote uh, American power, I would argue to this day. But he also argued that neutrals 
aside from offering humanitarian aid, which remains one of the uh, most important ongoing functions of neutrals to this day, aside from that humanitarian aid, they were otherwise extraneous to the future shape of international relations. The Italian expat living in the United States, Luigi Canovale, framed his rejection of neutrality in evocative terms as well, when he advocated in 1919 that the only means by which war can be prevented is by abolishing the neutrality of nations, that neutrality corresponds exactly to selfishness. In effect, Canovale blamed neutrals including the United States, for keeping the war going for so long. So as such, throughout our book, Ismay and I mobilize a more global and wider definition of total war that integrates neutrality. And it is one that is closer to the idea of guerre totale, total war, first posited by the French monarchist apologist, Leon Daudet in 1916, who in reflecting on the Verdun offensive that year, which cost more than 700,000 casualties, lamented how the war had evolved into a total war, a war between them or us, a war of existential crisis that would make no German ever welcome in France again. But by 1918, Daudet had nuanced his definition of guerre totale uh, somewhat, and he then described it as follows, as a struggle of political, economic, commercial, industrial, intellectual, legal, and financial domains. A war in which not only armies fight, but also traditions, institutions, customs, moral codes, emotions, and especially the banks. As such, the war was never contained in Europe or between the belligerent armed forces was a war carried on the winds of commerce, finance and information exchange, and as such neutral and belligerent civilians were both victims and instruments of this total global war. They certainly counted among its tens of millions of casualties. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Marcia Arvin, who really enjoyed your lecture, and I think everybody in this room found it fascinating. Um, by chance, the minute I woke up this morning, um, I heard that it is the anniversary of Germany invading Belgium, apparently on the 4th of August, the day that the United States declared its neutrality. Mm -hmm. So they mentioned that, I heard it in the morning, not even making the connection to tonight's lecture, but it is something that I think is a fascinating way of looking at neutrality and at war and total war and so many provocative things that you have brought to us that things that I think show that all the nuance of, of your subject and the depth in which you have really studied and mastered those subjects. We have a tradition in our faculty of not having a Q&A here, but we do invite you for both Kai and Korero where you can ask and, and debate and talk and have, have an intellectual conversation next door in old government house in the members lounge. So I do hope you can join us there and see us there. But before we do that, let's take this opportunity to give another really big round of applause to Professor Mike. <laughs>